So when I was thinking of a, of a text from the 1800s that I thought would be a good example of, of the various features, and uh, both contextual and technical, um, that you might be looking at in an 1800s text, um, I thought that some of Charles Dickens' fictional work might be quite interesting, partly because he's one of the first uh, really popular authors who writes for a, a much wider readership than other texts, which I think is very interesting contextually and you can see uh, in a number of ways. But also because he wrote about travel and so in terms of the idea of the Grand Tour and in terms of the idea of the reader in the 1800s sort of broadening their horizons in that romantic sense of, of, of understanding um, different natural surroundings and wanting to get the most of travel and wanting to understand the world. I thought it worked for all sorts of, of ways. So this is Charles Dickens' pictures from Italy. It's just an extract from that where he has travelled, he's, he's written basically a travel log, he's, 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 he's travelled around Italy and written up on it. So contextually it's very interesting um, in terms of this being an interest um, for the readership, but also it's interesting um, because we're getting travel journalism for a mass audience that, that probably didn't exist, you know, just not, not that many years before. So it's a, it's a fairly new form as well. Um, I've underlined uh, orthographic and discourse features in, in, in green, um, lexical features and semantic features in red, and then grammatical features in blue to hopefully show you some of the things that you, that you might uh, talk about. So in terms of ortho orthography and discourse, um, I've underlined a, a foreigner in the second paragraph. Okay, notice we've got the capitalization of foreigner. Um, so capitalization has, has, has become standardized over, over time. Now, now we use it for, for names. Um, so for proper nouns and, and for the start of sentences. Um, over time, it's gradually sort of got to that point from a point earlier on where the capitalization was, was used far more widely. And it was sort of almost any noun that was seen as important or even in some texts, uh, other words as well, primarily it would be nouns. So here we get it, but not all that often. We get foreigner in the second paragraph. We get picture, statue in the third paragraph. So we have got a bit of a pattern here with um, nouns being capitalised that we wouldn't capitalise now. But it does seem to be the important um, nouns. The fact that his status is, is, is this, this foreigner in, in Italy. Pictures, statues, notable items that he's seen. The next one on the next paragraph, this book. So again, the notable thing that, that, that we are reading. So we, we have got here... Um, something approaching a pattern with, with how um, capitalisation is used and a reduction in the amount of capital letters um, used. So it's moving towards Ina Haugen's uh, idea of kind of a fully implemented and standardised version of English that has very, very clear rules. It's still not 100% clear here, you know, some nouns are capitalised, some aren't. Notice on the, um, the, the penultimate paragraph, he says sunny day. So sunny is an adjective there, but that is capitalised, so both sunny and day are capitalised. That's the only adjective that seems to be capitalised apart from if, if they're at the, the start of a, of a sentence. The only thing I think you could, could perhaps say there is that sunny day is a collocation. In other words, it's two words that, that often go together. Um, so is it because he was going to capitalise days also capitalised as sunny as, as part of that that. Uh, collocation so almost sunny day becomes the noun you know that that, that that's what it is that might be what why you could argue that there's, there's that one adjective that's capitalized i've also um drawn that 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 line in green along the side just to, to draw your attention to the discourse structure what have we got here we've got much shorter paragraphs it's much 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 closer to the kind of text that we might read in a newspaper or magazine or website now it's it's far more easy to read um the discourse structure is far more clearly ordered uh, far more clearly arranged you wouldn't have got that in in previous texts so what we're seeing there is is a um the move towards um writing being more easily understandable uh, for all you know it, it, it's more easy to read and also this awareness of dickens of a much wider audience yeah many people um reading this text who who wouldn't have been able to read probably a hundred years before you know dickens is a very popular writer amongst many many people he's one of the first um authors consumed by a, by a mass audience who, who buy his novels in serialized versions so we've seen that change as well in the discourse structure. You're also getting, I've, I've, I've underlined the I hope on the, on the final paragraph, we're getting this first person uh, narrative from Dickens. So this sense of a, of a, of a traveller and, and who is writing from his own point of view. Again, different form of, of, of writing to what you may well have seen in, in earlier texts. Um, in terms of... Um, in terms of lexis and in terms of, 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 of semantics, um, I think the first thing you can say is, is actually 
the, the words in there, there's there's no words really in there that, that, that we wouldn't use today. Some of them are perhaps used less frequently today, but the, the language here, you know, used in the middle of the 1800s by Dickens isn't a million miles away to, to what's being used. Um, now, what we do get are words that are perhaps used a little bit less, and I've underlined it early on, the innumerable associations in twine. So all of those have a prefix or suffix. That's a bit of an overhang from the 1700s where there's constant prefixation and suffixation as words are adapted and, and changed to suit different needs. You've also got words of, of the French origin, innumerable associations entwined. Okay, so Dickens, as with the writers from the 1700s, I guess, you know, showing his intellect and, and, and describing things in the way that he wishes, but using that French and Latin uh, vocabulary um, to do that. Um, that said, we also get um, nods to this much wider readership than you'd had in the 1700s. Dickens talks about my readers, that, that possessive determiner there, my, my readers. This idea of a, of a relationship that's built up between Dickens and his readers, who may have bought many editions of his novels over you know, of serialisations um, in magazines. So this wider awareness of the reader and, and, and this much wider readership than, than would have been the case um, earlier on. I'll come on to it when I talk about grammar, but the fact that the subheading is the reader's passport, this idea that Dickens is going to these places so the reader feels like they have travelled and that's the experience that he is he's giving um, to us. And um, he talks about that that beautiful land. So again, the the, the, the um, adjective of, of, of French origin, the, the, the beautiful land. And um, we get uh, he talks about the authorities who were distrustful. So again, we get that that prefixation um, of of that word. And we also get at the end countrymen. So that's a, a compound word. Country and men have been put together. But notice again um, the 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 use of like the male root of words. He means people from his country, of course. But um, countrymen. So the assumption of of, of of the male form. I guess all. Also, because most probably travellers would be male, although although not all. So we get in um, this assumption of, of, of maleness um, that, that is fairly common in the in the, in the Victorian quite quite patriarchal um, era. Um, other ones we, we get um, metaphors used by Dickens. It's not massive surprises. He's, he's, he's a novelist, but he talks about um, shadows in the water. In the second section, he talks about the book being just shadows in the water. So this um, style of writing that sort of blends a, um, a, a more descriptive style of writing we might expect from fiction, the, the, the metaphor, the, the beautiful land, um, alongside a much more factual account of the eye, you know, I, I have seen. Um, he talks about if, if in, in the last but one paragraph, if they ever have a fanciful and idle air. Notice the repeated adjectives. We probably wouldn't do that as much today where you have multiple adjectives to describe the same uh, noun. But again, Dickens' style as a, as a, as a novelist is, is coming out there. He's, he's commenting on the fact that, that you know what, what I'm writing might be a little bit whimsical and might, might not be kind of um, so much about the hard facts. OK, but that's because as he says, you know, the sunny days of Italy have, have, have sort of affected how I think. In terms of grammar, um, the reader's passport, so you get that name phrase as, 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 as a subheading, um, I think is, 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 is important. You get that compound word passport. I mean, obviously, no, no it, it, it's, it's just a word in its own right, but it, it originally um, it would be a compound word. You know, it was literally a pass that allowed you to go from port to port in, 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 in the days of shipping. But the fact that this is used um, in, a, in a text with a much wider readership shows passport being coined and coming into more common usage uh, in, in, in English. It's something that would be familiar to his readers, showing the idea that travel is, is something that is seen as, as more common now. Um, we also say ne neither will they be found in these pages. So that prepositional phrase in these pages, this um, reference to Dickens writing the book himself and what the reader might be looking for in, in this book. Again, that awareness of the reader's role here, aware of this, this new kind of body of readers that, that wouldn't have existed um, in, in, in the past. Um, he talks about, as a child's been realising there, a foreigner to abstain from the discussion of any sub uh, questions. So we get that infinity. Remember, to followed by, by a verb is an infinitive. It's used like an adjective here to describe himself um, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a foreigner who, who isn't getting into um, wider, wider, wider sort of uh, debates about government. He's, he's saying, you know, really, I'm just talking about the travel. I don't want to get into the, the, the politics of it. OK, um, I, th I think there's a, another point there, of course, because in the 1700s, in the age of reason, I think he would be much more likely to do that. What Dickens is saying as a writer in the 1800s is I'd rather be idle. I'd rather be fancy. I'd rather not get into that reason and logic. I'd rather just tell you what I've seen. So you get this moving on from the 1700s real folks on reason and, um, you know, d debate and, and logic 
Dickens moves towards just just explaining what he's seeing, partly because his readership is wider. Um, but you also see that in the discourse structure, he's not getting into hefty debates. He's giving us um, snapshots of, of, of what he's seeing. Um, he says a bit later on, I never found that authority is constitutionally jealous. That's something that's a bit of an overhang from, from, from previous um, versions of English. So we get the noun authorities and then the adverb and adjective constitutionally jealous, which in modern English would, would, would come before the noun. Yeah, constitutionally jealous authorities. That's how we'd say it nowadays. Um, Dickens has, has reversed that. That's much more common in, in, in older texts. It's a bit of an overhang um, from, from, from French um, because French often has the noun followed by um, the, the uh, adjective. So le chat noir instead of the black cat. Yeah, we have the cat first and then followed by um, the adjective. So it's a bit of an overhang from, from French, but we still see signs of that still continuing into English in the 1800s. Not very often, but it's just an interesting point you can make about, about syntax. Another overhang of, of previous language is uh, the next paragraph. There is probably not a famous picture or statue in all Italy, but could be easily buried under a mountain of printed paper. Um, so... <sighs> What we'd say now is there is probably not a famous picture or statue in all of Italy that could not be easily buried. That's how we'd say it now, that could not be easily buried. The slightly more archaic form is that, but could. So, so the but mean, means not really, you know, th that could not be easily buried. So that modal is functioning in a slightly different way. But could, with that modal, is standing for what we'd say today as, as that could not. So the but is providing negation in a way that it, it doesn't um, in, in, in modern English. Again, that's an overhang of, of, of previous versions, but that, that, that is a different um, form of, 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 of writing. Um, and then we get... Um, he says, says, at any length on, on famous pictures and, and, and statues. So again, that prepositional phrase, making Dickens' point that I'm not going to go into this in great uh, detail. I'm giving you snapshots. Um, later on, um, we get the imaginations of most people. Um, so we get there that 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 name phrase and I guess also the prepositional phrase of, of most people. Um, again, Dickens talking about this idea that he is giving us these ideas that, that, that we will... Um, that, that, that we will understand in our imagination. The reader who can't travel, who can't go in this grand tour, is reading Dickens' work to see um, what, what, what he's done. It's the start of that kind of aspirational um, style of text, really. It's a text that shows the reader what they could do if only had, they had the money um, and the means. So again, he's aware of a much wider readership than, he'd have had, um, than the text would have had in the past. And um, he also says, um, texts on which um, places on which mine have dwelt for years and which have some interest for all. So we get the relative clause there. Remember, a clause that works like an adjective. He he um, describes um, the, the the places which have had some interest for all. So it works like an adjective um, to to describe that. But again, notice what that relative clause is doing. It's describing the fact that everyone is going to be interested in these places. So he's writing about them again for a much wider read, readership. We get the conditional clause, if they ever have a fanciful and idle air. So we're describing how he's, um, he, he's writing might feel a little bit, as I say, whimsical, not quite as, fac as factual. That shows a departure from the 1700s, but also shows Dickens being aware of that, which perhaps shows that, that this is a new form of writing. Um, and he says at the end or towards the end, I've done my best in one of my former productions um, to do uh, justice to them. So that prepositional phrase in one of my former productions refers to something else that Dickens has read. So we've seen this growing relationship between Dickens and the reader. The reader may well be aware of other things that Dickens has written. He refers back to them. Um, and so we get in this sense of relationship between Dickens and the reader. OK, so throughout those features, the key contextual things you could talk about is the growing awareness of travel in the Victorian era, the move towards wider readership, the departure from logic uh, and, 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 and the age of reason. And these sort of new forms of writing, travel logs and novels that were more popular for a wider readership that we wouldn't be uh, using today. We also get alongside this more readable, simplistic style, some overhangs of previous versions of, of, of uh, English, the adverb and adjective that come after the noun, which is different, and the but used as negation, which is different to what we'd use uh, today.